Is this the moment for Lee Fowler? It is. Take your place in Division 2, Huddersfield Town. He's missed. Steve Simonson clears the flame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Pate's got a chance. Yes. Pate scores. Jack Pate scores. Heffel is in there. Smith scores for Huddersfield Town. 3-2 Town. Boris Jerry, Danny Ward saves. Danny Ward saves. The quatch was in. Round the hair. 2-0 Huddersfield Town. Christopher Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend. And he takes that chance! Welcome to episode 18 of the Clinically Depressed And He Takes That Chance podcast. Unfortunately for you, uh, if you take a look at premierinjuries.com, <laughs> We have Neil is sadly out with an ankle injury, so he is not fit to podcast today. Danny G, I think, is away doing some form of Christmas shopping. And I did ask Ollie Fisher if he would like to step in. And Ollie said that his mum was making his tea for him, so he couldn't do it tonight. So if you want to tweet at Ollie Fisher and ask what he had for tea or what his mum made him for tea, please feel free to do so. So what that means is you've got myself, Matt, and you've got... The man in the comfy massage heating chair, hey. Richard Kosmala. Um, a rather intimate candle lit setting for us today, Cosy. Matt, I went, honestly, this would have been two days ago, I wouldn't have been here, but I did the old use your congolo, is a doubt, doubtful, unlikely, and then just turns up for business like you do. So, yeah, good to be here, but sounding a bit like Barry White today. So, a team that didn't turn up for business, and <laughs> me and you were. Uh, I wouldn't say upset in the car park, but a little bit defeated and downtrodden. Um, Uddersfield Town, nil, Newcastle won. For me, I thought Newcastle were every bit as bad as the Fulham team that turned up a couple of months ago. I thought they were dreadful, yet they've come away beaten us 1-0 and created more clear-cut chances than us. And... We're not going to go too far down the depressive route because I can hear people switching off right now <laughs> across SoundCloud's been closed, X has been clicked all over the place. But there were a couple of question marks about the game on Saturday, in particular the system and the 4-3-3 that was employed by David Wagner with Chris Lerver at that time stood up alongside De Poitre and Alex Pritchard. It was a bit of a a weird setup, Cosy. Yeah, we were saying last week that it's hard to second guess a Wagner, you know, team selection. Obviously, we were discussing last week there was doubts. We knew obviously Moy was out. We didn't know about Hog. I think we quoted him twenty five percent off that website. Did you get that figure from? Obviously, yeah, fake news. Or but probably what twenty five percent. Yeah, no, no, he was. Yeah, Premier yeah, He probably com, played twenty five percent fake because that's the kind of guy he is an absolute warrior. So yeah. I was surprised Eric Derm uh, was out of the plans, to be honest, mate. Uh, didn't see he'd, he'd kind of done a lot lot wrong, really. But, yeah, I think going back to kind of being a bit down, I think we all knew the importance of the game. It was quite interesting after the game talking to some of the Newcastle fans up in town and even one at work. And, yeah, they'll take the win. But they, they were kind of a bit, even though you'd said they had more chances, Matt. And I, and I know I like packages can sometimes put a different slant on things. But, and I did watch match of the day after. Going back after a good drink concession, I'll say that. So when I watched it, when I went all in kind of one piece, we looked to be the better side, and and it was almost like a smash and grab. But I think what we said on 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 Saturday it stands today that I think if we'd been playing till now, we wouldn't have scored. And it was such a big game, even a draw, mate, a scruffy draw keeps us kind of in there and 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 kick on Southampton. And I was really good because the the guy summed it up afterwards in in the gas club for me. He said, mate. This is my I can't know if I do your next mate. You were rubbish. Sorry, let's get it right, mate. We were rubbish, but you were even worse. Oh, stronger words to that effect, which summed it up to me. I'd argue that they were worse than us, but they came away with a win. To be honest, um, 
possession wise, yeah, I th- watching the highlights on Sky and before Newcastle had scored in the second half, we'd had eighty nine percent possession, and and then Newcastle obviously smash and grab is what they do. You know, they they spoil games, they kill games, they slow it down. They they I genuinely couldn't watch what they do week in week out. It's horrible football to watch. It's real sort of anti football, and in a in a sort of real negative way, but because it's Rafa Benitez and because it's Newcastle, it often gets quite overlooked mm. because you know it's a big club doing it. But the the way they play is really he didn't have any really shame Rafa. To be fair, after the game, he he said to me quite openly that look, we knew they'd play play a high line, you knew they'd press forward, turn the full backs forward, and what have you. But we always were looking to catch him on the break, which they did in spectacular style. So yeah, get with same Matt and I wouldn't want to watch it every week, but. I'd rather have what we had against Man United last year. What was it, twenty-one percent possession or what have you, and have the win. It's one of the stats that I really dislike in football. I think we were all unanimous, even on in our group chat on Sunday, when you know people seventy-four percent. So it does my head in when people are about percentage. Yeah, we can use it to say oh, they're the more competitive now than they used to be because obviously last season we were really struggling on the wrong end of the percentage. But if you're not testing the keeper, you know then. Doesn't matter. I'm not bothered. Southampton on Saturday, give me fifteen percent possession and, and a draw or a win than, than what we saw on Saturday. Just yeah, I'm not hiding behind that. And no, I'm I'm with you because yeah. possessions are counted uh, are calculated based on how many passes you've you've done, and you can easily get a high pass rate just by the goalkeeper and the two centre backs knocking it around together, and you're not really achieving anything on that. And it's not I'm not saying that's what we do because mm-hmm. we try and get the ball forward a bit a bit quicker, but. I think possession stats can be a bit misleading. It's not certainly not, uh, you know, in the same bracket as you know the territorial stats, whereby you can see how long you've spent camped in each different you know part of the part of the pitch. But percentage wise, it 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 was a it was a real killer. And to be honest, we're still down a little bit today, um, slightly slightly cheerier because there's another game on the horizon. But the um, it's it's a tough one because we we sat there before last week and we said look we have to win you know we we failed to beat Brighton we failed to beat Crystal Palace we failed to beat these teams we need to we need to beat Newcastle and potentially take six from them and Southampton and it's a, it's a bad start to two massive games it is but there's two common denominators with the Palace game on Saturday they were both sensational goals cutting edge absolute class Premier League top quality from two teams who for me are not Premier League top quality. And I don't think we have that as much as we say. We've got hard work, we've got graft, but we haven't got... Their goal was sensational. As much as they've got players who I probably wouldn't swap many of ours for. You were brilliant football. It opened us up. Drew in beautiful passes. Ron Dunn, who I'm not a... I don't rate him that much. No, beautiful finish. Obviously, Zaha, I don't want to kind of make everyone mad again by mentioning his name. But, yeah. And, and that's where the difference them two games. And, and you always know that your top six are going to have that class you know like what we saw at Arsenal the other week but you, you're up in that we're not going to see it from them teams and, and they did and I think we said it on Saturday Matt but the last 30 minutes 35 minutes or whatever it was we got playing the word we yeah it was finished mate I, I, we were only one goal behind we, but to me but we, we were done over, yeah. we were done mate the the problem obviously it's it's serious I was watching the highlights and again Keith Andrews he seems to do his every week on with Sky and again, he's 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 constantly going. He's going. The problem with Huddersfield is they don't score enough goals, and that's fine. And but everybody seems to think it's a goal scorer is going to fix this. Um, Depoach has had a couple of chances. He's he's made a real meal out of the one really early on where the balls come across. He's got ahead of Lascelles, I think it was, and he just had to really sort of head it towards goal. And he's kind of leant back and tried to volley, it and he's hooked it over. It's. I think what our strikers, I think I said this on Saturday, but what our strikers are really good at doing is turning half chances into no chances and, and proper chances into half chances, whereas we look like we need someone who's going to turn a half chance into a clear-cut one, and somebody like that is going to cost a lot of money. Yeah. Um, the thing is, I think, to, to be fair to Keith Andrews and you know other people, Wagner's come with an alley. If he didn't, to be fair, he denied it on Saturday. He says, most, you know, most of our games this season, we've had the chances. He didn't feel Saturday that we created them chances. It were different to the other games. I think he, he said something along them, them lines. So I know what you're saying there about the striker, but I think probably the facts are we are creating more chances. That all right, not you know loads compared to quite a lot of the teams, but the, a striker would have, in my opinion, compared to last year's other two, a chance of you know kind of keeping us in the Premier League. I mean, 
back to the day analysis has been so much maligned by everyone you know on this pod and, and tweets and stuff but I've stopped Alan, watching it yeah yeah I don't know if you did watch it Alan Shearer did some really good analysis on us apart from as usual they missed out the Lascelles uh, tackle which probably will come on to in a bit but but he was just mentioning about De Potter and, and there were no better of a tackler than, Eddie, you know, than Alan Shearer and he was just True, what, what he should have just cut that I mean the, that hook one that was another example that was a great chance but that you know the header you know it's just like if he'd attacked if he'd attacked that near post he would have buried that head. he would have done that last year he would have scored that last year and it was it it's such a sad sight and i know probably i probably wrecked your running mm. order again matt but to me it was a really sad sight seeing the potter not make any attempt was it really barely chased the ball down that ch- kind of sniff at the end he just looked a, a beaten man a man you know i know some people have said he's been lazy or what have you maybe it was something that would have been clattered into the adverts but I just looked at that I thought that is such a sad sight from a man who was lauded if you pardon the pawn Chelsea legend he'll go down history no matter what happens from here on in but to go from that in May to that just before Christmas it would have just a sad moment for me and just you yeah. said on Saturday before I think by a WhatsApp maybe not, not on the uh, post-match stuff but you said can you name one striker that's that's gone from up there, you know, as as, mm. as so revered and so popular and, and working so hard and talented to someone who's dropped off the face of the, you know, in terms of how they're playing. And I'm, str- I'm still struggling to think of anybody who's kind of come in and scored goals, looked really sharp, looked really good. And mm. A few people, I'll throw it back at you, Matt. It's normally you asking the questions, but quite a few people I've spoke to, kind of friends and what have you, their, their question is work ethic in the the last month and and that's something that I've always thought is granted I mean but then I would kind of say well hang on a minute Arsenal we were sat here saying how great you know he was charging into things and you know he looked a man possessed obviously the quality you know in front of goal that's what we want to see but and but some people are genuinely believe that I don't know whether they got it in for him but he's just not working as hard as as he was last season but do you see that or do you just think it's just a lack of quality no uh, I don't think he um I don't think it's dropped off his effort, to be honest. Um, I think the quality's dropped off. Something running, uh, something chronic. But for me, he's still working hard. But I, the one thing that I noticed last season and and it's this season as well, which I think people are maybe alluding to, is that he's very reactive in what happens. So he, you see, Mounier is constantly reading. He's constantly on the move. Whereas. De Poitre is always so static until something breaks or falls and then he sprints towards it and that often gives the illusion that he's working harder than what he actually is. Um, so you'll see a ball will go forward, he'll he'll lose the header, you know, and then it'll it'll drop off a it'll drop off wide somewhere and he'll he'll sprint and go out there and and to it, but he won't he won't read the situation. And for me, one of the problems with De Poitre is that he doesn't read situations anywhere near as well as Mounier and he's very reactive to everything that happens so so what you often see is the ball going forward and him sprinting at somebody into an area and it, it, often people think look at De Poitras sprinting there he's, he's working really hard but in reality he should have been there seconds earlier or he should have been on the move seconds early and anticipating mm. what's happening and one of the key things for me is De Poitras never really anticipates apart from maybe that ball over the top which you know he's he scored a couple of goals from me. He, he very rarely anticipates what's happening. Yeah, I mean, again, sorry to dig up old footage, but Man United last season, the you know, with the Lindelof mess, with that he anticipated that and finished mm-hmm. with a plum. But sad to see. And one thing I do wonder, and God, a Claxon alert, maybe even a, a criticised critical, uh, you know, of the uh, of the High Almighty. But I just wonder whether Wagner's loyalty, because he's such a law manager with his players, is. He's maybe going to have a bit of a a negative effect on others. So I, I'm thinking someone like Elias Kachunga. He must be sit, sat on that bench, thinking, "Hang on a minute here. As much as I love the Potter, give me a chance. You know, whether this is good enough for a Premier League striker, we don't know. But how long do you leave it before we do something different? I get that we've been without Mounier for three games and maybe four, if you include most of the Brighton game. But it must be so frustrating for them other guys. And and I'm just thinking, surely there comes a point where. As much as you lolly, and he is technically a striker, maybe Kajunga is not technically a striker, but do something different. I, I, I just think if I were coming into training and training the house down and just seeing what we're seeing, you know, like we have seen, 
for me, it's, after the Bournemouth game, I, I would have done something different. And I'm not just saying it after Saturday for a couple of games, but but no. And this is the problem because, and I think maybe that one of the reasons why he's kind of, I don't know, I body language kind of tailed off in the last half an hour because I think he must have known. It doesn't matter what I do, you know. And Richard Sutcliffe, I think, entered this on in his report on Monday in the Yorkshire Post saying he pretty much knows he's going to be replaced on Saturday. And I just think. But the thing is, if he if he, he puts the ball that. in the net and he works hard, he's not going to be replaced. That's no, that's so it shouldn't not. be the attitude yeah. that if he does have yeah. that, he shouldn't have that attitude because if he scores a goal, he's he keeps his shirt. Mm. You know, that's that's how it works in football. And I don't think, mm. I I don't think from knowing a few people behind the scenes at Huddersfield, you know, who've worked there in in other capacities, that Wagner is pretty. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's. Uh, Clinical, maybe he's he's yeah. very sort of um, he he wouldn't hesitate in replacing anybody in that team with somebody better if something yeah. came along. You know, he he he's loyal. He'll he's very um, he builds people up, but he's also he can also be very critical as well behind the scenes. But what he may say in front of a camera and what he may say behind it are often perhaps you know two different things. And I think one thing that I think's become noticeable with David Wagner, which I was going to talk about in a bit, but. There seems to be a couple of cracks, maybe not not so much cracks, but there's a little bit of a change in his post match uh, routine, if you like. Because usually he's very honest and he's very much, you know, yep, you know, we've got to accept what's happened today. We've lost the game. We have to accept it. We've got to move on. And that was always really refreshing. But he's kind of stopped doing that now, and he's started to whinge about officials and things going against us a bit. And I've never really seen him do that before. Uh, and it seems to have happened a little bit lately and he's become a bit he's not quite the sort of ambivalent happy-go-lucky guy anymore he seems to I don't know whether he's kind of stuck a bit himself you know in, in kind of a, a bit of a rut but to me there does there does need to be some form of change and I don't think it's I, I was going to mention this a bit later on but I might as well jump into it but I don't think it's going to be system related people keep saying why don't we play the wingers etc we we've seen what happens when we play wingers you know the wingers don't get into the box the wingers don't overlap they don't they don't attack you know it, they don't cut in and attack as as much as what you would perhaps expect them to do and neil put a tweet out actually um about what strikers i think it was on neil's actual private account rather than the and he takes that chance one so he says what what strikers are actually feasible you know defoe Morpe, Watkins, solanke abraham some longer etc and we had quite, or Neil had quite a bit of response to that, whereby people are sort of looking at, you know, Dom Solanke, um, Terry Cass says, uh, he thinks it'll definitely be Solanke and it could go either way, unless we spend on a big unknown. Um, Michael Casey mentions Mario Gomez, um, recently bought for 2.5 million at Stuttgart with a year left on his contract. Um, Eddie Hoyle, haircut club. Uh, says realistically out of those it'll be Solanke on loan I doubt Town will pay money for what's needed for the rest um, Dale Marsden who I wound him up well tried to wind him up a little bit earlier in the week by calling him a misery when obviously after the if you listen to the post match it's a bit rich <laughs> but um, he makes a fair point where he says Solanke isn't really that experienced and it's something I mentioned you know, when we were talking about Defoe the other week is that Solanke's not a prolific Premier League goal scorer and he's not played that many games really it's a big risk just to bring him in and rely on him and I think he's probably a bit right to be honest um, but for me there's people saying sign Jermaine Defoe three years ago maybe for me I think he's probably passed it now if you look at his Bournemouth appearances uh, Fernando Lorente has been mentioned but for me and David Wagner itself there's there's a different kind of change I, I would like to see Um you look slightly worried there, Cosy. I'm not going to say change the manager. I'll never say that with David Wagner. I'm a massive fan. Um, but I think what what I've talked about before on this podcast and, and the amount of times I must have said static is is quite ridiculous. You've probably heard me saying static, rigid, static, rigid, you know, like a broken yeah. record. And it's got to the point now whereby I don't think signing a new striker fixes anything. To be honest, I mentioned on Saturday the supply lines aren't good enough either because Depoitre's getting into areas, but the crosses aren't very good. But 
why the crosses aren't very good is because De has got four men around him mm. and he's the only man in the box. And this is something which is really going to have to change for me personally. And I know why we why we do it, because if we commit more men in the box, we get countered so easily through the middle of the pitch. And it seems to be a fear factor that we can't commit too many men forward because we're going to get turned over on the break if we don't do something with it. Yeah, I mean, that, that probably answers the question that I was going to mention there, because I was going to go back to say late championship days. We saw Mark Hudson put forward, you know, into the box and effortly obviously. We've seen it with Schindler this season as well. Yeah, he's, so he's we've been done it with forward, Schindler, yeah. but that, that was my thing on Saturday. I'm just thinking, come on. A Premier League team should not be no. throwing a centre-back forward. But it was clear, Matt, that there was nothing going to change as, as if it just went the distance what it is. I mean... I know he loves... Uh, I know Wagner loves control, doesn't he? He's, he's, yeah. He's, he he's loves never been a control gambler, of football. Mate. He's never been... No, no. It's, it's quite ironic because when we yeah. first came in, we were... We pasted a few teams, didn't we? I remember we beat Charlton 5-1. Yeah. We went to Belend Road and won 4-1, didn't we? And we, right, we, then, yeah. yeah, we 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 hammered some teams, but then we kind of curtailed that somewhat, mo- mostly for control. And the system that we play, like people keep tweeting towards me saying, we need to play wingers, we need to play 4-3-3, we need to play 4-2-3-1, 3-5-1-2. None of it genuinely matters until we change our approach and... The, you know, I keep saying as well that in the first third and the second third, we are really good. We are a really good side, and Wagner's nailed it. You know, in the defensive and the middle third, where we've not nailing it at the minute is obviously in that attacking <coughs> third, and obviously the guy knows far more than I will ever know. You know, David Wagner knows far more than I will ever know about tactics and how to play and the best out of players. But from a fan in the crowd, what what I look at is is really that we need to start breaking lines. And by that I mean, you never often see when when Moy gets the ball or Williams or whoever gets the ball in midfield, you never really see them pass into space. And one of the wingers actually make an early run to try to get round the back. It's always to feet. It's always about trying to get somebody one on one in a situation. And the only player that will ever break lines usually comes from right back, and it's usually Hadija and I flying forward from right back. You never really see um, if we play two in midfield. You'll never see the central midfielder kind of run beyond. You know, run beyond Pritchard. You'll never see Pritchard run beyond De Poitre. And and for me, that's something I would like to see change. I understand that we might get counted a bit more and we might need to struggle. But for me, we need a bit of a system rethink whereby we do need to remain solid because we need to be able to stay in games to nick them. You know, we, we, talent-wise, we're not up there with the best in, in the country, in, in the Premier League. But we've also got to be a bit braver in possession. We've got to look to maybe get you know, if De Poitre drops off, he's holding the ball. There was an incident on Saturday where Sobi came on and he came in from the right. Did he? Apparently. Oh, right. He came in from the right and he played the ball into De Poitre with his back to goal and then just backed off five yards to receive the ball back. I don't want to see that. I want to see him give the ball and then run beyond De Poitre to try and get in one of the channels. Yeah, they did that. I think it was quite funny with Sobi. So, again... I just I just nipped a tart saw a subs board coming up. I heard Rambo shout out Ramadan Subby. I know I honestly couldn't remember seeing him ever have the ball. I mean I know but South Stand and we were attacking the uh, you know the North Stand in the second half, but yeah, I can't remember the seeing him really in that as well. It were uh, he had a few, so he disappointing, had a few. wasn't it? Because you knew we'd lost to a poor side. And the Newcastle fans weren't ashamed to tell us that he were like rubbing his faces in it. Where I think Palace have few delusions of grandeur and what have you. I think Newcastle know where they are. I, I we met some great fans throughout the day and they were really good. But I'd love to have shut their hands and say, you know. You don't see many on Twitter though to be fair, do you? No, Twitter's <laughs> so. not a barometer of real life as we all know. As uh, we'll come to later on <laughs> with our spend, whopper of the spend, week. Spend. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, bad day. So there were three yeah. controversial incidents in the game um which could have maybe gone either way. Uh, one of them actually went in our favour for a change. I thought Anthony Taylor refereed the game reasonably well. I didn't have, really have any complaints, to be honest with you. Um, speaking so, speaking of Depoitre, Lascelles absolutely took him out on the touchline, didn't he? Is that when you when you think about Mounier, what he got sent off for? Would you then look at that challenge by Lascelles where he's kind of scissored Depoitre around the thigh? And would you say maybe that should be a red card? Well, Guy Mowbray's a fair commentator, uh, and he. Again, you probably didn't. You don't. You don't watch the match of the day stuff. But he were like, "Wow, that you know was very lucky just to get a yellow." Guy Mowbray was good as saying that should have been a red card. Uh, the angle that I had, I was thinking, "Wow, that's a strong challenge." Obviously, went into the adverse, but it would a wet day and what have you. But agricultural. Yeah. But, but if I'd have been sat 
in the riverside. Yeah, the way he he hooked his leg around that that's a leg breaker all day long, hundred percent. And God, no, everyone must be bored of me saying far this and far that. But I I'm thinking that's going to get a red on VAR, you know, next season. And uh, yeah, I, I again I don't like as you know I'm not a big one for getting me violin out with decisions and stuff. But I, yeah, that for sure that was another one. I think that that we should have had. It's another one maybe gone against us. Yeah. The other one as well is when Christian Atsu's gone in on Lursel as well. I don't think it's really been picked up by many, but when he challenged Lursel, his le- his foot has gone up and he stood and he stood on Lursel's knee, similar to what Mounier did as well. Um, and again, that's kind of gone a bit unnoticed by the referees. Oh, things like that are hard to pick up on. Lursel's gone down as a goalkeeper. You go down with arms and legs, and you expect a bit of a a bruising sometimes. You know, I speak from experience on that. But he did leave his foot in a bit cheeky. There a bit late did Atsu, and again that's another one that could have gone. But you look at it on the flip side, Hadjian nice has played Perez on, <laughs> so well, so he wanted, oh, well, yeah. So you know he's he's on side, yeah. is Perez there? It's a weird one, isn't it? Because I remember it was one of those. You know, you get your gut feels, don't you, at the time? And obviously, I'm behind the goal pretty much every week, so it's hard to really gauge. But it just all felt, ooh, he's miles off. I, I never contemplated he would even kind of close. And no, he was like, wow. Was when, when he were kind of getting some of the tweets later on from the, some of the journals, like, you were well on. I thought, what? But yeah. I keep saying I did have a good drink. But yeah, 100%, we got lucky. But but to be fair, Matt, we were one down and I thought we were done then. So 2 0. A lot of people stopped. It? To be yeah. fair, Lussell stopped, the defenders stopped. So what? you never know what yeah. c- could potentially happen. But I think it was a nice got, finish. Yeah. He's he's the kind of player I, I I really like Ayazi Perez. I think he's underrated by Newcastle fans who seem to think he's rubbish. Yeah. But I'd I'd have him in a shot, me. Yeah, go cool. unbelievable. It was almost like some Barcelona just burst out of their team. Where did that come from? It's Again, like Mowbray said his commentary. It was just the only bit of quality throughout the day. It was just so out of sync with a such a poor game. There's two ways to look at that goal. There's the, the way if you watch it from a Newcastle perspective, you sat there purring out. You thinking this is great. If you watch it from a Huddersfield one, you're thinking, why is, why is Zanka come across there? Why is Congolo not yeah. tracking him? Why is Billing pushing so high up? And it's, it's one of those, isn't it, where Newcastle fans all think yeah. it's great. And it, uh, from us, you think, why are our defence all over the shop here? What? There's no reason for them to be there. Well, you know, with us, Matt, the pa- their passing were intricate and, and ice cold. I'm, I'm not even counting the wrong. It was, ins- it was quick. Yeah, would we? As part of me still thinks our final ball would have gone to a centre back or what have you. Maybe who knows <laughs> one day that'll change, but. Yeah, it was a sickener and uh, yeah, I'm all about positives, mate. So we win on, on Saturday. We watch Arsenal beat Burnley on uh, Saturday dinner time and we're out of the bottom three. So yeah. So let's <laughs> let's get off Newcastle because yeah, me get, and you, me and you, you know, bin, we're, uh, our wrists yeah. are hanging out yeah, a little bit here. So Cosy, we've had a few people asking, you know, with Van Le Parra and what we've been asking for, people have been saying what's going on with him, what's going on with that. So I've had a, a quick look and the injury situation at Huddersfield Town is, and we'll cue the music. Okay, so the Aaron Moy news has obviously hit us quite hard, but for those looking, so PremierInjuries.com is actually a really, really good website if you want to um, have a look what's going on. Uh, we've got Danny Williams with a knee injury. He's got a medial knee injury in training. He is going to be out for 10 weeks, so a potential return date is 23rd of February 2019. Uh, Sabiri has undergone an operation to repair a broken collarbone. 
he is has a potential return date of the 9th of Feb. <coughs> so too does Aaron Moy, who has a MCL tear in his right knee. Uh, Tommy Smith uh, has torn his right hamstring. Uh, he will return at the end of January, likely around the 20th of Jan. And Reggie Van La Parra ha- currently has no return date with his mystery back injury. I think you can see one there. Neil Wayne uh, out for two weeks. Think that just be f- after the Burnley game, it looks like. And we will support you, our brothers in arms. Yeah. Goals is... I'm not going to get off the negativity just yet, so we're going to talk about in a little bit about the best and worst moments of 2018. And I wanted to have a look at goals scored in this year. Can you guess how many goals... It's it's home I really want to look at because you kind of make your home your fortress, don't you? So I've had a look at the goals. So could you guess how many goals we've scored? So since Boxing Day last year when... We, we played Stoke and we drew one all and funnily enough Ramadan Sobi scored for, for Stoke and in scored um, since then at home is this including Cup? no we went no, no. goal nap against Birmingham once 90 minutes ago. that was away though Was that, I think at home so we drew one all so we? I know this year obviously we've only so this is this is only at this home as well because we're going to say you make your home your fortress right. and this is where you need to be a bit braver in my opinion away from home I've got no issue with you know town kind of shutting up let shop let me have a guess then Matt and doing and, it. Obviously, people who've seen it, seen I've, I've done a print off of last year and this year, so I honestly have not looked at these so figures. So, 18 games, my art. 18 home games since. Oh, we're just doing home games. Yep, since the 30th of December oh last God. year. Oh, God. Now you've thrown me. So, 10 all season. Uh, this is probably where I get 10. picked up on the wrong stat. So, since Boxing Day last year, we've scored. Last season oh, we, we scored. Bournemouth, didn't we? So it can't, must be more than that. So we scored six goals from nine games at home. Wow, and four of them in one. Match. Four of those were in one match, <laughs> and this year we've got three in nine. So we've got nine goals in eighteen games, which is one in two. So one goal every two games. You take away the Bournemouth result, obviously you can't because it happened. But if you take away that Bournemouth result as a one-off. We have scored five goals in 17 games at home in the Premier League. And you know what, Matt? I think total credit to our fans because, yeah, I know we were playing Walsall and Yeovil and what have you not so long ago and all this lot and and back in the day. But any club bringing out them stats would expect to see protest, boos, individual people on people's backs and Honestly, I know. I think there were a bit of booing on Saturday, just a, a year after the final whistle. But I didn't really hear any. But no, it's been honestly uh, on the highlights. I picked some yeah, up, but I didn't when know. When you're playing a season card and and you know getting them kind of stats, it's, you've got to give total credit to our supporters really for sticking in there. Uh, yeah, you, you do. I think to be honest, I think our supports, by and large, it's been great. It, it genuinely really has. You know, it'd be so easy for them to just turn up. You know, we we watched. Remember, remember the comments we got from Wolves and it was like, oh, beware of the South Bank, etc., etc. Let's show them what a proper atmosphere is. We went 1-0 up yeah. early there and they sat with their thumbs in their mouths for 90 minutes and didn't make an absolute peep. And you don't get that from our fans. Our fans, you listen to the highlights and you can, okay, you can hear clappers and it annoys people, etc., etc. But you can also hear them singing, smile. you can hear Smile A While going a couple of times, you can hear this, that and the other. And to be fair, Newcastle... People were saying afterwards what, what great fans they were, but to be honest, they didn't make much of a peep until they scored as well. I, th- I thought our fans were really good. Yeah. No, and, and it was funny, we went on about kind of way and go absolutely, you know, nuts like we've not seen before. We mentioned about the West Ham fans. We probably said that's the most, I think Neil said that's the most crazy they've ever seen in the way fans go after a goal. The Newcastle fans went absolutely yeah, wild just... and because they knew how big that result was. Can I just go back to what you were saying with it about the striker though? Because... Again, I suppose I'll get your opinion, but do you think, because obviously we don't know, we assume we're going to get a striker, but do you think the powers that be, because Wagner's been very clear that you know, keep playing like this, it'll come, it'll come, you know, we, we, we'll, the luck will change, the luck will change. Do you think it's just a matter of this, Matt? The striker's got to work or we're doomed. Can we do anything different with these fringe players or is it just 
what do you think? I just it's I almost, know, almost it, like this strike has got the biggest pressure there's ever been. I got I got a tweet like. from uh, Ben Denby um, early in the week because he he wants to see the wingers come back and he he, he sent me the minutes that they've played and. You know, Sobey's only played, I don't think he'd even played 90 minutes yet. He'd, he's been injured. Um, and Benzer and Diakabi had only played around 250. I haven't got the exact numbers, but they'd only played around 250 minutes each uh, throughout this season. And to be honest, you never know. It, it just takes one moment where something clicks for one of them. You know, And, ben, and Benzer looks, he always looks like he's on the verge of something. <laughs> he's either on the verge of greatness or... <coughs> or Sunday League, you know what I mean? It just uh, yeah. it kind of takes one moment where maybe he curls one from twenty five yards and it flies in the top yeah. corner. All of a sudden his confidence flows, and all of a sudden he's a different player. Uh, Sobia maybe Sobia's the same as well. Maybe you know maybe one thing happens. Pritchard's not quite clicked, has he for me? And maybe it just takes him putting one in from twenty five yards, and it, all of a sudden he he's his heads up again. And yeah. and same for Mounier. Mounier might might score, and but. For pl- for players, it just takes a, a moment, and you know we could get Aaron Moy back, and Aaron Moy all of a sudden takes you know he could drag us over the line because he he is genuine quality. Um, but for me, we've got uh, particularly at home, we've got to allow players off. You know we've got to take the breaks off, especially at home. It just feels like when we get to the final third, everybody has to stand still. You know the the striker never moves in the box. The ball comes across, and I've been on about this all season. Mounier, no one ever makes a run across the box. They're always stood, stood still. There's nothing in the box. Should have potted out. Embarrassing. They were like six Newcastle defenders and Against just did pottery. Rubbish. That's, it's that's it's got to change. And the problem is when we've played, you know, four two three one, we got promoted with Kachunga. Often got in the box, but Van Lepara never did. And we'd we'd only have two, maybe three max in the box. You know, you'd have your number ten would, would slightly hang back a little bit, but and th- and that was. And and ages ago when we did the episode four with Reese Dinsdale and we were talking about Pritchard and I was saying I wanted somebody a little bit bigger than Pritchard to play number ten, you know, like Izzy and yeah. Casey Palmer was. And the reason for that is because when these balls come in the box, you're not gonna see Pritchard no. winning headers and scoring goals from that position. You might if we get a little bit closer in, but whereas, you know, Izzy Brown and, and Palmer scored quite a few goals from us getting, you know, into that wide position and the ball coming in and that's just why I wanted to see a bit more physicality there rather than uh, rather than a sort of a dinky little neat player. I'll tell you what's interesting, I mean, obviously you read out the goal stats at home but I think someone were quoting some of our stats, so many of our goals, set, how many of that haven't been set pieces of our goals? I don't know if you've got that to hand, Matt, but we've no, so, there's, there's hardly been any goals that have scored just in normal play, it's all been... Most this this is this is the problem, and, it, and it's because we don't break. You know what I mean? We we in 2017 we did. You look at some of the goals in 2017. Moy's goal against Newcastle. Kachunga's come across the box from the right, and he's played. You know, played a nice one-two. Mm. We don't play any one-twos around the box, and we just need to become a bit more break. And for me, that's the <coughs> thing that needs to change. We need to we need to believe a bit more. And we'd start to do that a little bit when we moved to that sort of three five one one system where Moy and Billing were allowed to join the attack a bit more because we're a little bit more solid behind but it's still and and someone pointed it out, I think it was Ian Kilroy on Twitter pointed out that if you're gonna play that system then you need your striker to score a lot of goals because you don't get much from elsewhere and and he's right. Um we do need goals from all over and, and it's not just the striker, we need to get goals from other areas, especially in that final third. We can't keep relying on the centre backs chipping in with Headers. It's incredible to think that we came out of Molyneux, such a great performance, like Zane mentioned there about the support and what have you. And then, again, we, d- we don't know, no one can fast forward it to me and know where we're going to end up. And again, I could have a gut feel because t- I think there were a time last year, as much as I believed, I just felt maybe we were going. But I just wonder we've got that momentum. We had that, you know, good point against West Ham. And I know, no matter what you think about Michael Oliver and, and whether Mooney had been done to death, and I got myself in. A little bit of a debate with someone, but we've got the momentum. We're one up, and all of a sudden, that happens, and we lose the next. Four. It just felt there would that could be our moment, mate, where this were it. And it's incredible to think. I, I I look back and think, hang on, mate, Wolves were just end of November. It feels like end of October. We lost, we lost four straight, and it's just like it almost feels like we're scratching around again. Where I thought we really had some momentum, and we did because Brighton were poor, but but. That's sending it. off and the injuries have really sort of yeah. dented us. But we've got to just forget that now 
and this is where it's going to be such a test of character for everyone on, on Saturday, you know, on and off the pitch. And I know we've done it to death and we're the 12th man and this, that and the other. Because I, I don't I'm know sorry, about I'm you. Just, I'm just looking on Twitter. I'm just trying to get a tweet up. Um, and there's just so many people taking the mick about Edin Dzeko coming to Huddersfield. <laughs> where just, did that come from? It's just some it's, random it's, tweet. Yeah, it's, it's funny. <laughs> but <laughs> I I watched the Southampton game uh, on, on Sunday and honestly, it... It were on, I, I've not been feeling well as well and then to see Mr Wapstin yeah I just couldn't believe it they asked not, honestly I've still kind of not put it to bed what they asked keep people doing and then of, of all people to get such a goal like that and his big cheesy grin and I just thought that's unbelievable but you know what the place were bouncing their clappers were bouncing they, they looked vibrant they looked good the guy you know put on a bit of an act for the cameras Ralph whatever his name is they looked up for it so to me you know, people say we're at home, and but I, we're underdog on Saturday. We've got to forget about what happened. Saturday just gone. We've got to forget about you know what people have an opinions whether the pod should be in and that. We've really got to give absolutely everything and that. So this game, I know, forget about you know in the league table and stuff. And we knew we were going to be a big game anyway, whether we won last week or not. But this now is just I just want this could be <laughs> this yeah. and Burnley and Fulham are massive. Yeah, they are. I just think though, if we can, because. Arsenal haven't done as many favours to be fair in, in recent times but you'd expect them oh god to beat but we could be at the bottom three on Saturdays as, and, it, and again it's just crazy to think because it, it, we feel really down you're saying now you're still kind of a bit good but we've just got to forget about it and do what we, we're good at just really go for it and we have not mentioned one man but again I thought it were a promising kind of camp you know home debut from a guy from another country the last time we saw him was at Stoke City on a Tuesday night kind of being mocked throughout world football shall we say with a 45 yard own goal <laughs> yeah. Junini Bakuna I thought don't get me wrong without him looking like he were gonna you know open up defences I thought he would really got better as the game went along horrible conditions thought he was good he looked comfortable on the ball he must have gained so much confidence in that game I, I thought he was you know we were mentioning about positives you mentioned about Philip Billing probably being your favourite but yeah. Kind of on reflection, I, I think Bakuna was a plus point, and no, it was. It was I think it was all right, yeah. He should surely start on Saturday, shouldn't he? I think you can still see he looks very. There's a certain occasions where he does look very raw, and you think, what's he doing there? And he's tracking of men, and he's putting his foot in, and letting people get the wrong side. Um, was was a little bit evident, but it it was definitely a plus point. You know, he 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 tried. He ended up very deep at points in the second half. I thought first half he he put a free kick in in the first half, mm. which was really clever. And obviously nobody read it because it was no, way too clever. No. But it, it was it was almost like a straight free kick, and he put so much curve on, yeah. and it just whipped around at the last second. It was a really really good free kick, and he's he's definitely one for the future. Yeah. And you know, I don't know if you've got his song's going to be an hard one to uh, catch on, isn't it? Cause is it not his word? Bakuna Matata? Janino, do do Bakuna, do do Janino, Bakuna. And to be fair, it sounded quite good, a bit like a kind of a war chant, but. Yeah, so if you're there, that's what we need. We need to sing. But no, I always like town debutants over the years. Some have sunk, some have swim. I mean, I know we, we played at, at Stoke, but yeah, that that one in the positive column on Saturday for me. Yeah, and and this is this is ultra negative, ultra negative. Cut it, cut. But <laughs> but if the worst should happen and we get relegated at the end of the season and we lose Moy and Billing, as you would expect, we've got someone there who's ready to hopefully step in. He looks he looks just short of. 20, 30 championship games before he's ready to make an impact at this level to me. And yeah, we've we've got one there that's an interesting project plan. And if the worst should come to fruition, if you like, then we've got somebody there who's who's ready made who who can step in and we don't need to go out and sign X, Y, and Z and panic about replacing placing. So mm. and even then, you know, if we if we do stay up and billing leaves, you know, as as people are sort of mooting at the minute. Although I did see a cracking article um, this morning, which was sent to me by Soccer Souls or somebody, and it was about how Philip Billing was destined for a bigger club, and that Bournemouth should sign him. And I was just looking at it going, bigger club, okay, and then Bournemouth, and it was just like, yeah, it just depends what your <laughs> definition is, though, because in that analogy, you could say Leeds are bigger than whatever and all this lot, but Bournemouth probably pay more wages than us and. Their fees are a bit bigger than us, but but yeah, ultimately it's Premier League football, isn't it? We a team that's play positive football, and uh, 
yeah. But I, I'll, you know, I'll be up for Saturday. I just don't, especially when you've got two home games back to back and you've lost the first one. I just hope people don't bring in that stuff from that negativity. They maybe the individual yeah. teams. I want them to leave it outside the turnstiles on Saturday. I know it's hard and the stats are damning at home. Not much excitement, but come on, we want to see Charlie Austin. Yeah, we'll get on his back. We know we're going to be chanting and open himself up to a late winner when he dives on his knees in front of the south stand and probably gets a, a missile thrown at him and we get banned or what have you. But yeah, I honestly think this is the one I, I but most people finish for Christmas. This honestly, let's get the place absolutely bouncing on, on Saturday because I honestly think we've, you know, yeah, we're not down if we don't win or lose, draw, but part of me feels, yeah, it's, it's not an option, we've got to win. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm with you. I, we can win. Absolutely. Mounier will come back in for me. Um, 100%. I would, I would, without Aaron Moy, there seems no point in playing three central midfielders to me because you, you, you pick your best players, don't you? You know, yeah. we've got three really good centre backs and we've got three really good central midfielders and you kind of want them all on the pitch. So that back three system made a lot of sense. Um, without Aaron Moy, I I know Bakuna played quite well against Southampton, but I would probably throw in Mbenza. Um, Where would you play him? From the start. I would go back to 4 2 3 1. I would not have low, <laughs> Chris Lerver on the left wing again. Yeah. Um, he's a great player, is Lerver. I, I think he could do a job in centre midfield. His energy level's incredible, aren't they? Yeah, I, I really like Chris Lerver. Yeah. I love how angry he gets when we lose and how it affects yeah. him and how he cares. I, I think, and he's and he's a quality player. You just don't but I don't want him up front. No, <laughs> it's no, as no. simple as that. But. I um I would probably go back to a four two three one. Um I would probably play um Lussel, Dermot right back, um, Zanka, Schindler, Congolo, Lisa providing they're all fit, Hogg and Billing as the two in midfield, uh, Pritchard behind Mounier, and then I would have um, Benza on one flank and I'm a little bit undecided on the other. It probably wouldn't be Chris Lerver, um, but it just depends if Rajiv Van La Parra is is fit or not. We've been asking the question, what's going on with him for weeks, well, and it, apparently back, it's back come thing, out he's got a well, mysterious where's that come back from, injury. That, I've not seen it from the club. I don't go on the website. I think it was a tweet from the official Huddersfield Town one, I think, in passing after the game, apparently. Apparently he's got a back injury, but if he's yeah, fit, is it he as good as that play. tweet of Man United with Pogba? And, uh, yeah, we're just an advertising <laughs> thing that got deleted. Yeah, well. I, I would probably have Van La Parra back in, but or worst comes to worst, you could still play that four three three. But I'd rather see Mbenza up there with Pritchard and Mounier rather than Chris Lerver. But there just needs to be a bit more intent from us. Um, the three five one one system's fine when you've got players bombing from deep and they're actually coming forward, but. We don't really have the players to do that now, so we, I think we've got to maybe look at getting more people into the final third and more people who who can unlock defences, really. Um, but we've opened it up to Twitter, our favourite platform. Um, <laughs> so I don't know if it was you or Neil who tweeted this. Neil, I think yeah. it must have been Neil. So he's put, so HTFC fans with Southampton at the John Smith Stadium next Saturday. Who would you pick? What formation would you use? Uh, De Poitre or Mounier, should we see wingers unleashed? Let us know your thoughts so we can discuss on this week's podcast. I don't know if I said I'd have De Poitre up front against um, against Southampton, but I wouldn't. I'd, I'd definitely put Mounier back in. Um, so we've had an incredible, we've had a lot of responses to this, which is really, really great. So thank you for everybody who's who's got in touch. Uh, we've had forty six comments, which I think is a bit of a record. Um, so I'll try to read out as many as I can because people take the time to get in touch with us so I always want to try and read these out where I can. Um, so Freddie Cocker says, we need pace up top and more pressing from the front. I'd start Mounier with Kachunga off of him. Uh, same team, otherwise we have no options to draw from. Uh, Scott Bradley says, nothing to lose so it's super cause up front for me. The hard work in the gym has to pay off eventually. That'll be true apart from this week. I've had a shocking book. <laughs> Sorry Scott, I'm uh, 20%... It's not like likely the, to play. We're not going to see like Depoitier <laughs> with a pint of ale on the bike. I can do we? what he can do, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ben Dingby say, uh, Denby says um, three, four, one, two. Um, Schindler, Zanka, Congolo, Derm, Hog, Billing, Van La Parra as a left wing back, and Pritchard and Mounier and Kachunga or and Benz and Diakabi up front. I liked his sub bench. I think Neil liked his sub bench, which was Duncan Shearer, Maskell, Booth, Stewart, and the Chief. Uh, 
Paul Sheridan's asked to what's asked what's happened to Van La Parra, which we've just covered. Uh, Chris Taylor go with a three four one two with Kachungra and Munier up front as well. That seems to be quite a popular call to try something different with Kachunga up front, Cosy, which we we mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, I remember Kachunga up front in the championship not really working, um, <laughs> so I'm a little bit reluctant to try that. Although then again, I just wanna... up front's not really working either. So but his Instagram account, I just want him to play because his his snap his Instagram stories are just showing him warming up now with dramatic music in the background. And obviously you can't knock his enthusiasm whether it's him or his management team. But again, it just shows everything about the guy, real positive character. And that's what to me, it's not, if you can't get a game now when we've scored 10 goals all season and, you know, come on, get him on the pitch. Let's see what he can do. And you'll never know. I, I just don't get it. I'd be fuming if I, would you be? If you were Kachunga? Um... I think to be Desperate to be really, really, like, really yeah, get me on, get me on, get me on star. Uh, yeah, I think I would be, but I think to be blunt, when he played last season, he wasn't really. He didn't. I don't think he really showed up that well. I think he had an injury, didn't he? Sort of end of yeah. uh, before uh, just after Wembley, and then he never really settled to in be until. Fair, I thought he was just starting to Watford click in the year before, obviously the. Uh, yeah, I did. He seemed to have a... Watford, but yeah, but honestly, mate, he's driving in Leeds Road. He's put his indicator. It's going down Canal Side. He must be thinking, what's the point? A grey all day, another seal. It's wet. But his attitude is spot on, mate. The guy for me deserves to get him on. You know, even as a sub, I couldn't believe it. On yeah, Saturday. I think get I, him on. I think that I think there's an argument definitely because as, if you're looking to get people in the box and off of people, putting a centre back and a target man up front just invites defenders to sit on them. Whereas someone like Kachunga's moving in the box, yeah. and that's what we're looking. So you need you need a bit of a contrast to the big yeah. men. I think of the, I know you'd have to put people on just for crowd noise, but the crowd would love it, wouldn't it? His chant and what have you, and. To me, it'd give you more than probably Sobby would, although I'd be, he's not played much enough to probably say. But yeah, I was surprised we didn't see him on that lineup at two o'clock on Saturday, but kind of shelved with the nose. That I can very rarely get a, a Wagner team. <laughs> I said that live in last week's pod. Mm. So we've got Jamie Atkinson says 4 2 3 1 got us promoted and kept us up. Um, get some numbers into the final third, which is what we've been saying. Uh, which is great. So, uh, HTFC Images says, against Southampton and Newcastle, the crossing and aerial game is useless. Um, it needs to be played on the floor more against these physical yeah, sides, so big, therefore big Benza needs to play. I that Sunday, good point. Mm, so, and Benza needs to play up front as yeah. he's got pace. So, yeah, so I yeah. think Southampton, we need to get behind, don't we? So yeah, definitely. I, that's partly why we're playing Benza as well, just to try yeah, and get behind. Yeah, that's what I thought we missed against Palace. We should have done that. Uh, Malky, our buddy from... New York, who's probably going to be cursing us again for this second depressive, <laughs> depressive uh, podcast we put in now. But he's put, it doesn't really matter who we play. Time to start getting players into the opposing penalty area. We'll never score again. Uh, and Mounier back in. So again, correct. And so Claire, uh, so thanks to uh, to Claire, Tom Reaney as well. Um, Terrier's TV football writer will go four four two um, with Kachunga and Mounier up front. Uh, Nick Shackleton as well says Mounier back in. Um, Sam also suggesting three four two one or four two three one, but he's not sure about what offensive players to play off Mounier. Phil Lawton um, says apart from Mounier, um, apart from Mounier for Depoitre, stick with the same team, uh, change the twelfth man. Um, and then Jody Calvert, I think, has probably got it right where she says, "I think I'll just cry quietly and sneak the occasional look through my fingers." I think that's how. Most I'll tell of you what, must have done a bad job because looking at their squad and their team on Sunday, it's incredible as, as much as we don't like him. Their bench had Charlie Austin on it, Shane Long. Yeah, you could say maybe whether they're, they're up for it. You know, Stephen Davis, who I thought were the best player when they played at our place last year. James Ward-Prowse. So absolute... I mean, you look at our bench, God. Not with no disrespect, which obviously means you plenty of disrespect, but we haven't got anything like that. So no wonder, you know, that guy, new managers think, wow. So it does worry a little bit to think, surely he's got to get a tune out of some of that. But yeah, they've got quite a lot of firepower. But I say, let's, you know, we don't want to die wondering Saturday. Let's let's go for it. But we've, we've said this before. And yeah. Yeah, thanks. So, thanks to everyone else for commenting. Paul Dobbin, Andrew Garner, Bradley, uh, William Bradbury, etc. Everybody. Um, Mr. Watson and Josie McGregor. I think all kind of saying similar things. Mounier up front. Um, and just need to get bodies in the box. That is quite quite simply what people are asking yeah. for and it's been a it's been a bit of a running theme for me for two since 2018 i remember the swansea game that swansea game where we had 11 versus 10 and yet we we put 
Yeah. I think it was 60 crosses into the box and every time we had one man in the box, which was... You said that last week, Matt, didn't you? That as, can we play against... We, we've got a bad record of playing against 10 men, but without going back up. With and without, yeah. yeah. With and without. Um, so don't sing off, off, off when Sostin's <laughs> uh, put, stuck the boot in again on Lasso. Everyone listening. So... Since Neil's not here, this probably won't have the same impact. You're on your own here, mate. <laughs> but uh, but we're, we're going to throw in a Whopper of the Week. Right, Cosy, have you, have you ever left your phone unlocked somewhere in the pub maybe or maybe when you're out with your mates or, or maybe even more sinisterly thought you're on one website and then entered uh, entered something on a different I, one by mistake i heard from sport from cricketers there's sometimes games a credit card roulette and I don't, and there's games a phone roulette where i think there must be something to a drinking game and if someone loses someone gets access to someone's phone in a minute they can send as many messages as they can to as many people which sounds like my idea of absolute hell but I think anyone <laughs> when was it Matt it was Tuesday was it anyone going through their Twitter feed on Tuesday normal usual stuff Mourinho should go clock blah 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 and then Nigel Clibbins has given it the old hold my beer hasn't he and said I'm going to blow <laughs> these ones out of the water and he's uh, he's he's put an interesting hashtag on there I'm not going to well, repeat it, it. Yeah, well um, on his account as I'd well. like to think it's him yeah I'd like to think <laughs> there's more to trains in his life <laughs> but he's um put an interesting one out there and um I'm not I'm not going to repeat it we're a family friendly show um but People there's a few know. screenshots People floating know. around and I think and the tweet has been deleted I'll have Mr Pogba if you I think if you take a look at Graham Rayner's uh, Twitter feed you might see a screenshot <laughs> there if you really want but this week's Whopper of the Weep is the train loving <laughs> inter- oh, internet United. genius, internet genius Nigel Clebbins. Well done, Nigel. So, let's talk. There's been quite a few stories, obviously, in the Premier League over recent days. We have to, I mean, it's incredible. We could have talked about Marino being sacked and we probably were playing Bury away and it doesn't have any relevance to us at all apart from it's just a football story. I don't know about you, Matt, but my first thought was, because everyone used to have second clubs, Liverpool, Man U, whatever. My first thought was, no, because I thought genuinely we might have had a chance of getting a chance. Something, and we still might have unboxing day, but my first reaction was, couldn't you have waited? Yeah, I think that, <laughs> I think, I think that's happened once or twice to us this, this yeah. year, hasn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think since the very start, I, I just felt Jose Mourinho was a really bad fit for Man United. Um, he's tactically, he's too negative for what Man United expect. You know, those fans expect sort of a cavalier swashbuckling attacking style of football and Mourinho's very sort of rigid <coughs> systems and, and are probably not made for Man United and I think he's he's kind of it almost feels like he was the man you know 10 years ago but f- I think football at the top end is all about fluidity now and and trying to get players in certain areas which are very very unusual um, so which Pep Guardiola's completely mastered at the very top and I just, I just feel like the top end of football might just have passed Mr. Mourinho a, a by a bit more, and his his methods have become a little bit dated. I don't know how you feel about that. When people open their presents on Christmas Day and they open up a Lynx Africa set, like most men will do, and that as well, socks. You know what you're gonna get? <laughs> a pretty average deodorant, a pretty average gel. When Man United departed Mourinho, that's probably the worst knowledge it's ever been. <laughs> but you leave it and don't cut it but when Man United apart Mourinho they, they, that was what it was about I think people forget they were in such a mess you know kind of no real kind of he has steadied them a little bit yeah. to be fair hasn't he? he's had he, a he definitely, little bit of structure there. His, his, his welcome but 
I think that's half of the problems because yeah I know I've seen these tweets going around he's, he's won more trophies than Klopp etc etc but I think this is the thing we were kind of mentioned with us the fans sticking in there despite the lack of goals it's it's that excitement I think I mean even on Sunday because I, I was trying to some of the Man United fans I were like saying well come on there were two deflections in Liverpool but you know really because normally if you lost a dab you'd, you'd come up with excuses but they just weren't having it they were saying look excuses you know the deflections they, like they were, gonna win they were the rubbish game, though, they? And, and it needs to change I think they were that sick of the football but it's all the carry on and Matt Ayer and Pogba on the bench and when you you know, when I've seen the odd games they look you know the players who are going to do something it yeah a lot of the stuff in the in the media it, I, I must admit I was surprised I, I thought it was going to go to the end of the season but it seems weird doesn't it to yeah, it sack, sack a guy yeah. like Joe Zimmer when, when they've done what they've done seems. yeah they don't seem to have a plan and I think that's part of the problem at Man United I know this isn't a Man United podcast but the part of the problem is the back you know, behind the manager at Man United you know Ed Woodward etc and all that lot don't really seem to have much of a clue of of what's going on there or, or what they need to do to get Man United back to the very top and I think finishing second last year might have might have just kind of set a few expectation levels that they were further down the line than what they actually were do you know and, and I would probably say that that's possibly hindered him slightly but I, I just feel like the, the, I don't really know what's going on there and I, I think there needs to be more of a sweeping wow. change than just Jose Mourinho because the, uh, for a club like Man United not to really have much of a plan and to, to bring out Ole Gunnar Solskjaer who got relegated with Cardiff yeah. it just seems a bizarre one you would you would expect a Man, a Man United of the past you know when they were a behemoth if you like just to go we're getting rid of him there and we're going to get him there and I think the bit that would worry me because I, we've been there with ex-players and don't get me wrong Pierre Jackson didn't work out too bad did it but there seems to be you know, needs need someone who knows the club and United because am I right in saying Mickey Phelan's gone back back today to kind of assist and because he got Solskjaer there seems to be this craving well, obviously they're very you know up front on our screens these Man United pundits we see Roy Keane what a time for him to come you know in the studio on Sunday obviously Neville which you know, don't get me going on this tree which you know I thought were pathetic from a I suppose, I suppose a broad, professional broadcaster not a fan who's doing a podcast pathetic tweet to Pogba but <laughs> Yeah, that's just my opinion. But anyway, back on topic. I think you might have misread the um, misread the Pogba one. Yeah, you probably put through put out by a management team. Yeah, but I don't know. There seems to be this craving get someone in from United. But so what about? I think he can't lose. Yeah, Matt, because if he if they just fade away, that you know Champions League, PSG, maybe they'll get through. Maybe they're not. I don't know. They finish seventh. Don't win any of the cups. They'll say, well, the players, it's not, you know, it's not all his fault. The players are getting new matches. I think there are enough good players there. But what happens if he does well? What happens if they fly at the table? They get in the far, they win, I don't know, the FA Cup or something, Champions League. There's a decision to make then. But I suppose they might be said that to him. Look, Ollie, if you do a job, because I don't know enough about, because he's in, he's in management in a, in a team in Norway, and I know their seasons are different. Because part of me thinks, well, hang on a minute. If you know, I know it's Man United, but if you know you're only going to get the job till May. They've said he's on loan, technically, haven't they? Have they? Yeah, yeah it seems weird, news. but I know, obviously, it's like, almost like amateur football with hopefully no Norwegians listening. But, so it's Man yeah. United's set-up at the minute, I think. Yeah, it's all very <laughs> strange. It, I, th I think the end wasn't a surprise, but just, just when it's happened, it's a surprise. And, uh, yeah, the big question is, it'd be interesting to watch from afar. There's no fan of Man United, and hopefully it won't start going in Boxing Day, but... Of course, is it because the, the people say they haven't got Man United haven't got the players that was said by Keane on, on Sunday and they've not I got the players for Man that. United I don't really agree with that but I look at him and think I don't think he's got the best out of these players personally no I but don't only, we'll, only, we'll see now in the next five months I think there's some good players there I think Rashford Martial really really talented players and I don't think he's getting yeah. the best out of them No, but hopefully Solskjaer doesn't <coughs> get the best out of them either because we've got to go there on Boxing Day haven't we and depending on yeah. Hopefully the, the, it does on Saturday though. <laughs> yeah, and against Cardiff, you you, you do kind of hope that they have a bounce, Man United, because a lot of teams, what happens is they have the bounce in the first game and then they go back again. You know, it's it's yeah, like please. one step forward, two steps yeah. back. Solskjaer doesn't fill me with a dread, you know, that we'll be going to Man United and facing an Ole Gunnar Solskjaer team because you know he's he's recording in England over here is not that great, but it is Man United and. You do wonder, don't you, whether we may have got a point or may have been able to bore them to death over there. Because, mm. you know, being being rigid does really sort of affect, you know, we play Man United twice and 
we beat them 2-1 last year and we were 0-0 at half time last year at Old Trafford as well just by being rigid yeah. and putting men behind the ball and you just wonder if that's going to change under Solskjaer and whether the game plan we'd have gone with is now yeah I mean it, now defunct it's an it's an interesting one I'm just hoping that yeah he you know Solskjaer comes in and does what he did at Cardiff if that's what we want him but not on Saturday because uh, yeah we want them to get the three points but uh yeah, Boxing Day has become that little bit, uh, you know, more difficult. So, so yeah, I'm right, he's in his first home games against us, isn't it? It is. Oh, no. So that's <laughs> obviously going to be there, you know. But the only thing I'd say, Matt, and I'm not everyone might have the opinion, but when we had Mick Wadsworth, you'd have took anyone to be the next manager. So there'll be people who have hated Mourinho for some time, so they won't, you know, like we're saying we can't get it. They'll, you get a lot of people, a bit like Wednesday fans now, they don't like this just look. I'll take anyone. I'll take any help. So, so, yeah, so we're thinking it's an odd one, obviously, but they'll be saying Alt's oh, got to be better than what Mourinho, so I suppose only time will tell. Does that bring us nice out to Man United preview? And, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, I've never heard Mick Wadsworth compared <laughs> to Jose Mourinho, so okay, I'll give you one for that. But I, um, another guy who who's just coming is Claudio Ranieri as well at Fulham, and we've got them as well on the 29th, and we're kind of doing these little mini previews now because there's not going to be another podcast until the new year. And We've got now Southampton, Man United, Fulham, and then Burnley probably before we do a new podcast. Yeah. We will be doing some there. post-match stuff. I'll try and do some stuff for Fulham and, and boxing. Hopefully not as <laughs> depressive as we were on Saturday. Matt, do you, how many points do you, would you say out of those four games? I think Are you including the Burnley one on top and obviously Saturday. Yeah. Ooh, I think we word. need six points minimum. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed. If we don't get that. The trouble is, I, I kind of want. Do in I don't like saying I don't look, must not lose game, but I would kind of think if we could have got three and maybe I live in fantasy land three against Newcastle, three against Southampton, then I'm thinking Fulham a draw will do me fine. But to be honest, I think we might need to go down there and they they, they yeah. were really unimpressive against West Ham. So yeah, the leak goals like left, right, and centre, don't they? Yeah, and we well. don't score goals, so it's, no, it's going to be just it, so, yeah. so it's either going to be yeah. nil nil or. One nil either way, or maybe we, you know, we could go there and win one nil. But honest, if they beat us, it's probably three nil. Talk it up and Solskjaer, we, we can't expect anything else after can we? I know it sounds defeat. But this is what we're saying on Saturday: is that we're running yeah. out of these winnable games. Yeah. If we if we don't beat Brighton, if yeah. we don't beat Palace, we don't beat X Y Z down at the bottom. We then need to start beating teams like Man United, and that's my worry. Um, in that we're we're not winning games which you would. You know, you put yeah. a marker against certain games though, at the start of the year and you go, do you know what, we need to pick up points there, 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 yeah. and there. If you fail to do so, then you need to yeah. start taking them from But can I Man put United, some spin on it, can we send it another way? We we win on Saturday, and I know it's a big if and what have you, and I've just looked at, at the odds and Southampton are massive favourites. I was quite surprised, I thought it'd be a lot more even than that. But say we win and we're out in the bottom three, we've been pretty, it's been pretty much hard work and a struggle, but we're nearly halfway through the season and it's, Others have changed the managers, and as frustrating as it's been, we, we could be out of the bottom three. So I think we've just got to take positive. There's half of the season to go. I know you can pick them games out and this games out, but I, I want to kind of be staying half full glass and say, look, we could be walking away Saturday having us Christmas drinks, looking at that league team on above that line. And to me, it's all to play for. Yeah, part of you thinks if this and if that, and some ref would have done this and that and the other, but I'm trying to think, yeah, it is what it is, second half of the season. and kick on knowing we can bring in a reinforcement but you don't get me wrong I'm worried but it is so it's going to be as long as we're in this division yeah so a mate of mine um, over in <coughs> USA uh, Gavin Walsh said uh, you know he put he he tweeted as well which was quite a good one which said um, we've got 21 games left uh, we're on 10 points and probably 34 35 points in total keeps you up and you've got to look at where we're going to get these 24 points from. It's the equivalent of eight wins, which means that we're going to have to win 38% of the games till the re well, rest of the season. Well, we need that, though, Matt. That's the thing. We just don't know, do we? Well, it, to me, if if we lose against Southampton, it, it starts to look like that bottom seven we were talking about is starting to go into a bottom four, you know, because some of the teams are starting to pull away a little bit. And we really do need to start beating teams down there to, to just to make sure as much as anything that we keep it a seven rather than four because I don't you know you look at three from seven you think oh those aren't too bad odds but three from four it's not, <laughs> not the odds there aren't so good I ain't accepted a tweet conversation I don't, I don't like people doing this to me but so I thought a bit cheeky but between Andy Oldsworth thanks for the sealed promotion legend and uh, Mr. Reese Dinsdale of 
yeah, and he takes that chance podcast. I think we'll say, but I think Andy Hills has put a tweet. He must be a Man United fan as well. We just didn't still, but. You know, only after Boxing Day, surely, Andy. And Andy also put, I'm fearing the Boxing Day to forget. And I kind of piped up with a Boxing Day to forget. Huddersfield Town are at Man United on Boxing Day in a league game. And I know people say, well, but, 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 but no. Man, we used to be at Port Vale, Walsall. Huddersfield Town are at Old Trafford on Boxing Day in a Premier League football match. That ain't a day to forget. That's a day to enjoy, man. No, I'll agree with you because I remember going to Carlisle every year. Yeah, remember when <laughs> so, we did and we lost and all, it were horrendous. I man. was there, yeah, I was. We were absolutely freezing and all, didn't we? I think I went in the coach, I think we lost 3-0 or something and I think I went on the coach about half past four, it, it were horrendous. It's. I remember seeing a video of you and uh, Daz Goodall and a few others. Oh, did man, that, that, yeah. that guy Mulberry <laughs> thing and that as well, yeah, yeah. yeah Back in good. the day, we had that Raddy and B. Yeah. <laughs> You won and all that that Tuesday night. Yeah, I think you did. Good memories, yeah. You never forget where you come from, I say. Cool. So um, I think what we'll do is we'll have a... Um, this is obviously the last podcast of the year, and I do apologise. It is another sombre one. Me and you have kind of got our sombre voices on. It feels a bit like a funeral, doesn't well, it? this bit's not going to be because we're going to be but proper... But let's, let's perk up a little bit now in case... you know, Just, just in case people are still listening to, to what we're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Going into 2019, we should hopefully have more uh, more guests on board. We've got a couple lined up. Uh, we just need to uh, set some dates with them, so keep an eye out for what we've got coming up. Uh, we should hopefully, once uh, my mate Johnny uh, sorts himself out, we should have a website up and running. Uh, we now have a, a Facebook account, uh, so give it a, a follow or a like on there. We've got a new Instagram account as well, which you're currently manning, aren't you, Cozzy? Uh, and again, follow us on on SoundCloud, YouTube, and and Twitter. Um, it does make a difference. Uh, clicking the like button and, and following. I hate to beg for these things, but it's it's essentially uh, does help us out if you do do that. Uh, and also um, our sponsors. Thanks to uh, BidorByGolf.com who have sponsored us throughout the course of uh, their second half of this year. Um, if you quite fancy a holiday in Spain, and I know you do, Cosy, and you want to yeah, take in some <laughs> and take in some golf, uh, have a look at bidorbygolf.com. Uh, there's some good deals on green fees and accommodation there. And with 2018 drawing to a close, the curtain is ready to be drawn, but not before the voice. <laughs> Hastily trying to find a song. There's no preparation goes into this pod. Don't let anyone be fooled. I do, that. by the way. <laughs> one day, man. No one else does. No one yeah, else does. Also, just me. Yeah, just me. <laughs> that as well, yeah. But we have, seeing as though it's Christmas, we could do with a little bit of Michael Boldley <laughs> and, and maybe a nice Christmas jingle. Yeah. Last Christmas. Zanka bought us a drink, but the very next day we gave it away. This year, <laughs> to save me from tears, Mooney Ake bought us shirts. That's it. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Keep supporting the pod. Have a great Christmas. Is this the moment for Lee Fowler? It is. Take your place in Division 2, Huddersfield Town. He's missed. Steve Simonson clears the flame of the goal and collapses in a heap of tears. Pate's got a chance. Yes. And he scores. Jack Pate scores. Heffel is in there. Schmidt scores for Field Town. 3 2 Town. For a sherry, Danny Ward saves! Danny Ward saves! The quarter's in, round the hair! 2 0 on a field town! Christopher Schindler has a chance to write his name in Huddersfield Town legend.